you see my screen? Yep. Yes. Okay. Is it still visible without any issue? Mm, yeah, except you're showing a whole lot of things. Now? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, so, good morning, everyone. Uh, sorry for the issue with my mic previously. So, uh, I was reading this book and I thought this would be a nice book to present. So, this is a book by... Uh, Ronald Bashman and Hector Levick, Cold Machines Like Us, Towards AI with Common Sense. So this was published last year uh, in May. So uh, this is a book about common sense from the standpoint of artificial intelligence. So uh, they have a nice example for motivating uh, why we need common sense. So I'll, I'll go with that first. So imagine that uh, we, we live in a future where self-driving cars are very popular and they are much better than they are now so they can reliably avoid obstacles obey traffic light signs and uh, respond to turn signals and all that and you have autonomous carts in golf courses and movie lots and everywhere so basically uh, these vehicles are now doing a better job job in driving than you so you could send that to a grocery store and it, the the people at the grocery store could uh, pack up whatever that you ordered and send it on back home. So um, now that you have your own car, one day you uh, need the car to go to a grocery store and pick up something because it's July 4th and you want to host uh, something at your place. So you would send the car uh, and uh, so you wait, it's a very close, close by store. You wait 15, 16 minutes, the car is not coming. So you're wondering what happens. You go to the app that it provides. You look at the car, it's not moving. It's still at one spot. And you could see from the cameras mounted on the car that it's at a tra traffic light. The traffic light is red. So it's doing what it's supposed to do, right? Uh, so, but what happens here is that the traffic light is indeed red. It has been red for like 10 minutes, but what the car cannot identify is that uh, there are other uh, people the other side and they're getting out of their cars. They're looking at some direction, they're talking and there's music coming, all that. Because even though your uh, car is uh, trained on identifying honking signals and all that cameras to detect um, certain activities but not activities like this that is happening so it, it stays uh, and uh, after a while you see that after a while this happens so there's a parade but this car is not equipped with knowledge to understand what is happening so uh, i think about if you were in that place you would get out, you would look at what is happening. And when you hear this music and everything, you would think, okay, there might be a parade. And you would think of several different things. Uh, should I wait a bit longer? Should I drive through the red light? Should I make a, another turn at intersection, go back or whatever, right? So, uh, so what happens in these situations is, uh, to take the action that you would like to take, that you would take as a human, it does not require you to have expertise in driving. You don't have to have spent uh, hundreds and thousands of hours on the road to come up with the solution or behavior like that to go home or go to another store. So these things are not learned uh, through uh, like routine. It's, this is not a routine thing, right? You would have to think about it but then you would not want a pencil and paper to come out with a solution. You just have to be able to take into account some things about the current situation and then you use your common sense. Uh, so uh, what happens with AI systems right now is they are very fragile. So they are 
very good at some things but with some things they break down mostly in the situations where they are the unpredictable things happen where they are not trained for so um, as humans our ability to interact with this open ended world is because we have something called common sense so what happens when it is not there and uh, what needs to be done uh, when there is a non human driver that would want to navigate the world like us so this is a book about how these systems could implement what is known as common sense or whether it's possible and all these issues around it uh, so uh, the book gives a very simple definition of common sense so um, in this definition it says common sense is the ability to make effective use of ordinary everyday experiential knowledge in achieving ordinary everyday practical goals so effective uh, in this case reminds us of um, that it is not enough to merely know a lot of relevant things using common sense means being able to work through this knowledge successfully without being overwhelmed uh, in order to find out what to do so this should be fast and effortless and when you say ordinary and everyday it implies that common sense deals with uh, situations that we encounter every day it's day to day life things we don't need specialized education or ex like expert analytics or anything like that it's it's about familiar mundane things and what experiential means uh, it e emphasizes uh, on uh, what we gain the knowledge we gain from repeated experiences so it's generally it's it does not come through schooling or technical reading maybe in some cases common wisdom can be passed from one person to another but generally a common sense is derived from personal experience and uh, practical practicality the word practical here stresses that common sense is for uh, making choices about what to do to be successful in everyday world so it it doesn't have to be academic pursuit or any philosophical argument or anything it's like achieving practical goals so um, there are two ways of invoking common sense uh, these order, uh, authors put out this so one is uh, the bottom up approach so as we talked about earlier we most of the things that we do uh, in our day to day regular life is mundane so we walk we brush our teeth sometimes play sports even commute to work uh, without much conscious thought so our minds are free to think about other things right we can plan how we are getting dinner and we can think about important presentation at work and things like that but uh, sometimes some things happen uh, that we expect something to work but it would not work like a door is being stuck or your car doesn't start then you stop you have to uh, change the mental gears and then you come out of the routine and you try to find out what happens so at that point uh, common sense is invoked so that is the bottom up invoking so we try to find interpretations for what happened in a top down approach it's uh, not as uh, quick as that so there are situations where you really have to make plans to achieve goals but these are very simple plans you don't need a pen and paper to do this planning so things like that uh, like planning something uh, planning to pick up a parcel right uh, and you need to see okay if i'm going to get the parcel i need to check the uh, open hours of the post office maybe it's sunday it's not open you need to check all that and this type of planning things still even though they are not very fast you need some type of common sense so this is identify as top down common sense and um, they are trying to do this uh, do this thing about comparing common sense with system 1 and system 2 thinking in uh, daniel kahneman's work so uh, 
in Daniel Kahneman's work, system one thinking is identified as quick and reflexive kind of uh, thing. And system two thinking is more thoughtful. It's problem uh, solving style. Um, what this author says, um, common sense inference is very quick and it's intuitive, but they say that it doesn't completely align with system one. So the question they ask is that, According to Daniel Kahneman, the system one can respond to these questions like two plus two is four and when you drive on an empty road, all of these things are system one things. But what they're asking is, uh, in this sentence, right, the large ball crashed through the table because it was made of steel. So I'll, I'll refer to this sentence uh, later also, but when you try to figure out what it means, is it really system one or do we have to do a little bit more thinking? So they say to align these two systems, their common sense system and the system one, system two approach, there needs to be more work. And um, so. Uh, Tilly, um, can I ask a couple of quick questions, please? Yeah. yeah. The first question is, uh, is uh, common, uh, did the book talk about common sense being shared information? do I and someone else share the same common sense or is it personal? I have some common sense, which I <laughs> think is obvious to me, but the other person doesn't uh, think that way. I think uh, they talk about a shared notion, but in, in some parts they say uh, there could be situations where you can uh, like pass on whatever you gained experientially but they don't make a very stark distinction between the two. Okay. Okay. And the second question is about the S1, as you were mentioning here, right? S1 and S2. So um, uh, you are observing something and uh, that's, um, I mean, and, and so they make this distinction that, um, you know, the it resolution could not be done, right? So uh do they actually go into some uh specifics of how um like uh can it actually convert from s2 to s1 in 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 uh, the general theory of this dual uh, dual dual theory of uh, decision making uh there are decisions which start in one way and then over time they move into s1 so for example driving skill learning it starts as a s2 decision right and then over time, you gain enough experiences and that becomes part of your S1 um, reasoning or rather uh, decision making, right? So do they talk about transfer of uh, knowledge across S1 and S2? No, actually, uh, however much they talk about S1 and S2 is just one paragraph trying to say how common sense is different from S1 and S2. So what they're saying specifically is this it revolution uh, they're actually asking, can we really say it is S1? So what they're really saying is that we need more whatever research to actually say that. But they refer to some, I can't remember this person, but they refer to a, a continuum from uh, rationality to quasi-rationality. So they, they use that continuum to actually talk about common sense, not really aligning with this one S2 system. Yeah, so, so I think, yeah. uh, you know, some... Uh, you know, I, I don't know if others uh, believe that I happen to uh, believe that there is not a, and others may be doing the same, that there's no uh, clear distinction or uh, uh, demarcation uh, between these two. And in fact, both of them interact very, even if you think of S1 and S2, they interact with, uh, uh, you know, each of them uh, effectively. Uh, taking the example of car, uh, you know, that you learn and it, it becomes now, a, uh, uh, you know, involuntary aspect. Well, it may also happen that uh, car, your normal driving car is like an S1. You are not paying, you don't have to do much at all thinking about it. It kind of happens on autopilot. But um, moment there is something that is different and unusual, it suddenly kicks up into thinking and say, what should I do? And if it is not part of your uh, training uh, that uh, allows you to work autonomously and, and a quick reaction and through perception, you really need to get into cognition and, uh, and S2 and, and, and uh, take care of those situations. So on exceptions, 
S1 may kick into S2 um, also. And so there may be also, you know, they, yeah, and there may be also situations where they, you, you, um, um, one side, one, uh, what is normal in S2 will concern, you know, will become S2 and come back to S2 uh, and vice versa. Yeah, true. So uh, let me move on to the common sense in language too. So sometimes, most of the time, uh, we use language in a in autopilot. Actually, we we connect words together, words together, and we pronounce and reference all that. It feels like autopilot, right? So, uh, but in certain instances uh, where there is potential ambiguity, right? Uh, we we sort to common sense. So in uh, in this. Uh, sentence in this sentence what does it refers to so it's it's technically ambiguous but it it could be the ball it could be the table but we immediately we resort and we picture that a heavy metal ball is falling through this table and crashing so we don't think of it as referring to the table and we don't even think about what the table might be made of it's just common sense that heavy metal things can break through items that is not made of metal uh interestingly the reasoning is quite different if we just change one word in the sentence so now the large ball crashed through the table because it was made of cardboard now what does it refers to it's not uh anymore the large ball it's the cardboard now cardboard it's a table now because we changed the word steel from cardboard right so uh, now we use our knowledge of flimsy objects uh made of cardboard right so um, these kind of inferences are made quickly and automatically and they are firmly based on common sense understanding of the world so uh, they don't really talk about uh, grounding but i think there is some some uh, push towards grounding in here too that you know, humans ability to ground uh, knowledge and all that and uh, the author, one of the authors here is like Hector Levick. So he came up with this Winograd Vino, schema challenge. If you know, this is, uh, this is something he came up with, uh, telling that um, his, his, uh, his logic was that Turing test is not anymore a very a good test to identify human-like human intelligence, if you will. So he came up with this type of uh, sentence pairs and tried uh, to use like machines, uh, asking machines whether it could do this uh, uh, disambiguation of this it pronoun resolution, right? Uh, but I think later in 2016, he came up with this, I think, but in later in 2019, I think most of the models, language-based models, they, they were scoring more than 90%. So. It would be interesting to see whether ChatGPT can do this or not. I couldn't check that, but yeah. So, uh, and then finally, uh, common sense is one, one facet, right? We need expert knowledge to expert knowledge. And if we are in puzzle mode, if we know what we are tackling with like algebra or logic, it's outside of the domain of uh, common sense and even cognitive biases. So the Kahneman and Tversky, along with others, have shown many places where common sense break down. So it's not the final ultimate thing, but it's among several other things. So, um, so this book looks at several themes in AI, like game-inspired search, natural language, and autonomous systems, data-driven learning. And it figures out uh, a few limitations and a few common threads. One is uh, uh, that the success of these systems often depends on brute force, uh, enabled by either immense amount of data or computation resources. Also, uh, these systems exhibits high level of performance in some areas of expertise, maybe recognizing photos of cats or identifying uh, blood infections or playing arcade video games. So they are, they are better than humans. But uh, in some cases, they're extremely poor. So outside the area of the expertise, they're 
not performing well. So uh, they are actually asking, uh, what are these systems? Can you really say these are intelligent systems or are they really idiot savants? So uh, idiot savant uh, is a person with a several uh, um, a severe mental uh, or a learning disability that is yet superbly gifted in performing a certain specialized mental uh, task. So if you watch this film, there is a character that is played by Dustin Hoffman here, the movie Rain Man, that kind of illustrates this, uh, this uh, fact. So moving on. So this is one thing I liked in this book. Uh, it talks about emergent phenomena, and I think it's now we are looking at this. So uh, what is emergent phenomena? So it is a macroscopic effects resulting from a large number of microscopic events. So this is there in economics biology. So in economics, uh, the appropriate prices are arrived at automatically by self-interested buyers and sellers in a free market. So you don't do anything, but it the, the market achieves that state. And also in biology, large scale structures that results from individual actions of tiny animals, such as termite mounds. So what happens in AI uh, with regard to emergent phenomena? So uh, the idea would be, uh, so last year paper was put out by Google Brain on transactions on machine learning research that describes the abilities of models and how they change with scale. So the idea is something like this. If you provide a system with enough data over a long period of time, so that it is training, uh, and eventually it would train on sufficient data to cover anything the system might need to deal with. So the most common type of things would be seen frequently in training, yet if the data is truly massive enough, right? Much rare things also would be seen, and it would be able to predict it with more accuracy. So with, with more and more data, system would start making fewer and fewer errors, right? So there, there certainly be certain issues that would pop up. Extremely rare things would not be able, these, these systems would not be able to predict, but it would, humans are not also as good, right? They're not perfect. So why would you want a system to be perfect? So this is, this is the, uh, this is the idea put forth uh, in emergent phenomena. So this uh, book talks about uh, how, uh, what is the issue with this uh, faulty, this, this, this idea is faulty and what it, how would you explain that is, it is faulty? So uh, the first, first point is related to the scope of events. So we can think uh, that a system that imitates human intelligence can do that by dealing with only a manageable number of objects, even though the world has a really large number of objects, you can go by with a small number of objects. But that's actually not the point. The point really is that even if you have a small number of objects, it can be arranged in astronomical number of ways, right? And what is important is uh, how it is arranged. So the example that they take is with words. So it's not that the individual words matter. It's the arrangement that matters. So dog bites person versus person bites dog. So this, this arrangement in phrases and sentences, that is what is overwhelming. So for example, if you have a four word English sentence in a thousand vocabulary language, uh, the number of ways that you can arrange that sentence would be trillion. And if you have eight uh, letter sentence, if you try to do that, it's trillion, trillion. So it's huge. So th this explains why we, when we read new pieces of text, right, most of the time, we feel like this is fresh and original. So they take an example from a poem written by William Blake, The Tiger. The word, the just a pair of words, fearful symmetry. So that is, the, these words, if you take them by themselves, right, they're not remarkable. They're just normal words. 
but if you put them together that that is the important thing so um, and also they talk about so if you give a system or a person a first sentence of every novel that is ever been written would you still be able to predict the next uh, the first sentence of the next novel that would be written so that is uh, the importance of arrangement so arrangements are unique to tackle this it's not an easy thing so then they move on to uh, this long tail distribution issue so again to simplify that they come up with this example of a lottery ticket so imagine a lottery with 100 million tickets so the chance of picking any given ticket will be very small that is one in 100 million so suppose that every minute you draw a ticket at random right because the lottery is very big the chance of seeing a particular ticket even after a century is still 50 50 meaning that in a world like that an extremely rare event happens every minute so uh, what they're saying is a real world is something like this lottery so there are so many different exceptional things that are waiting to happen at any given time so we can see this so long long tail distribution in most of the time so they again take a um, example from a uh, language so if you um, look at this uh, british national corpus it's a guy uh, it's a huge uh, database of english text drawn from uh, several sources so it has about 100 million words in total most of the words are common and they occur often so the word like the it's very common it's occurring six million times in the corpus and the word time is the most common noun it's occurring 183,000 times so if there are some rare words that show up only once in the entire corpus uh, the british adjective niffy is uh, something like that it's just there once so the chance of selecting one of these words at random from the corpus would be one in a hundred million, right? It's just like the lottery example. But there are so many of these single, single occurrence words in the corpus. So they make up roughly half of this uh, uh, corpus. So uh, if you kind of draw hundred words at random, right? The odds of picking one of these rare single word, uh, single occurrence words would be better than 50-50. So these extremely rare words are quite common. So uh, what uh, this author says that if we want an AI system to be able to deal in a reasonable way with things uh, that happen in the real world, which, which are like not very common as we saw, we need something beyond an expertise that derives from uh, sampling from what has happened already so for that you need common sense so i think it is a very interesting argument but uh, so this is written in 2022 um, i don't know what is happening with chat gpt though so it is true that it has seen whatever that hap happens before that and you cannot really predict uh, with this long tail distribution and scope of events but it's interesting to hear everyone's perspectives so yeah this is my last slide so this book talks about uh, knowledge re and its representation uh, a lot and uh, again how uh, we can use reasoning here so it says that we focus on creating uh, knowledge graphs and all these representations, but reasoning aspect is not uh, very well tackled. And it uh, gives uh, 10 steps, I think, towards implementation. So um, that is it. I oh, like very nice, uh, Tilini. Uh, this was a good review. Um, yes, well, if I could interject something here. There's an important distinction that um, uh, the book seems to miss, and that is there's sort of two kinds of systems that require common sense. So one of them is if you see a picture of a large object heading towards a fragile 
table, you can predict that the object is going to crash through the table. Uh, that sort of involves a understanding of the natural world and some physics, things like that. It requires that kind of common sense. There's another kind where the world consists of agents or humans that have intentions. So if you imagine a, a traffic scenario with lots of cars, uh, you can think of them in terms of sort of the physics of the cars moving and uh, what the limitations are, how fast they can move from one point to another. But if one car has its turn signal turned on, then physics won't help you predict what will happen next. Uh, it might be that, that the driver of that car doesn't realize there's another car in its blind spot, it will move over and cause an accident. It might be that the car that's in the blind spot will honk its horn, uh, something that would be very common in India where I've uh, driven. Uh, it might be that the car that's in the way will slow down and allow the car to change lanes. All of this involves understanding the intentions of humans or agents. And that's a different kind of common sense than can be inferred simply from the physics of the domain. Uh, I think that's an important distinction. Yes, true. Thank you. Uh... Dr. Yunus, actually they might be talking about it later in the book, but uh, from the first half that I've looked at, I, I did not really, but yeah, that makes perfect sense. Very good. <laughs>